Work we must, but the lunch is free. Bounty from on high, all or nothing. The famous geologist Sir Julian Huxley used to go from school to school in the manner of a traveling revivalist, preaching his gospel of evolution. In the evolutionary pattern of thought, there is no longer need or room for the supernatural. The earth was not created, it evolved. So did all the animals and plants that inhabit it, including our human selves, mind and soul, as well as brain and body. So did religion. He was fond of reminding his audiences that there is no Santa Claus, and that mature people should give up wishful thinking about such things as gifts and blessings, spiritual or material, bestowed from on high. The high school youth of my day took great satisfaction in reciting the words of Omar Khayyam, And that inverted bowl we call the sky, where under crawling cooped we live and die, lift not the hands to it for help, for it rolls impotently on as thou or I. This is, as one eminent commentator on the scientific scene, Hoymar von Ditfurth, puts it, that modern view, still current today, that the earth with everything in it is dangling in the isolation of a universe whose cold majesty disdains it. Deep down we are probably even proud of the detachment with which we accept our true situation. Much of the cynicism and nihilism characteristic of the modern psyche can be traced to this chilling concept. But within the past decade or so, leaders in scientific research have begun to express the opposite opinion to this, saying that they more than suspect the possibility, one, that somebody out there cares, that is, there is a direction and purpose to what is going on, and two, that gifts sent down from above are more than a childish tradition. The first of these ideas was expressed by the biologist Lewis Thomas. I cannot make peace with the randomness doctrine. I cannot abide the notion of purposelessness and blind chance in nature, and yet I do not know what to put in its place for the quieting of my mind. We talk, some of us anyway, about the absurdity of the human situation, but we do this because we do not know how we fit in, or what we are for. The stories we used to make up to explain ourselves do not make sense anymore, and we have run out of new stories for the moment. A grand old-timer in biology, the 1937 Nobel Prize winner, Albert Sense Georgi, wrote, According to present ideas, this change in the nucleic acid, which determines the nature of protein molecules formed in the cell, is accomplished through random variation. If I were trying to pass a biology examination, I would vigorously support this theory. Yet in my mind, I have never been able to accept fully the idea that the adaption and harmonious building of those complex biological systems involving simultaneous changes in thousands of genes, are the results of molecular accidents. The probability that all of these genes should have changed together through random variation is practically zero. I have always been seeking some higher organizing principle that is leading the living system towards improvement and adaption. I know this is biological heresy. For example, I do not think that the extremely complex speech center of the human brain was created by random mutations that happened to improve the chances of survival of individuals. I cannot accept the notion that this capacity arose through random alterations, relying on the survival of the fittest. I believe that some principle must have guided the development toward the kind of speech center that was needed. More surprising is the story now unfolding as various fields of research combine to give us a picture of gifts being showered upon us from on high, the literal reading of the Santa Claus or Kachina myth. Thus Buckminster Fuller says, Energies emanating from celestial regions remote from planet Earth are indeed converging and accumulating in planet Earth's biosphere, both as radiation and as matter. We aboard Earth are receiving gratis just the amount of prime energy wealth to regenerate biological life on board. Van Allen belts, the ionosphere, stratosphere, and atmosphere all refractively differentiate the radiation frequencies, separating them into a variety of indirect, life-sustaining energy transactions. Vegetation is the prime energy impounder. From stellar radiation, the biologicals are continually multiplying their beautiful cellular, molecular, and atomic structurings that complete the equation. Certainly the Earth is not the center of the universe, writes von Ditfurth, but this crowded Earth is a focal point in the universe, one of perhaps innumerable places in the cosmos where life and consciousness could flourish. 
What a concentration of mighty forces upon one more or less tiny point. Is it possible that someone does have us in mind? This is the thesis famous astronomer Sir Fred Hoyle pursued. In a talk given at Caltech in November of 1981, he begins with the strange fact that there are distributed in all directions throughout the immensity of space particles whose presence is revealed by the way in which they obscure the galaxies everywhere, making them all look hazy, whence their original designation as nebulas or fuzzy clouds. After almost 20 years of investigation, the inescapable conclusion has been reached that the grains had to be made up largely of organic material. Like the biologists quoted above, Hoyle too, as he puts it, was constantly plagued by the thought that the number of ways in which even a single enzyme could be wrongly constructed was greater than the number of all the atoms in the universe, and yet these were correctly constructed. So try as I would, I couldn't convince myself that even the whole universe would be sufficient to find life by random processes, by what are called the blind forces of nature. That is where he too balks. By far the simplest way to arrive at the correct sequence of amino acids in the enzymes would be by thought, not random processes. Rather than accept the fantastically small probability of life having arisen through the blind forces of nature, it seemed better to suppose that the origin of life was a deliberate intellectual act. One of the most exciting things about the process, he finds, is that it is still going on, and always has been, and to all purposes always will be. Instead of beginning with a single cell on this one lone planet billions of years ago, life has been brought down to earth from realms above in massive installments. It was quickly apparent that the facts pointed overwhelmingly against life being of terrestrial origin. Here Hoyle pursues a long line of argument and review of research. For example, because a few comets are breaking up and scattering their contents all the time, the process was not relegated to the remote past. Taking the view, palatable to most ordinary folk, but exceedingly unpalatable to scientists, that there is an enormous intelligence abroad in the universe, it becomes necessary to write blind forces out of astronomy, as Thomas and since Georgie put it out of biology. As if to counteract these growing heresies, the old Darwinian view is being puffed for all it's worth in half a dozen prestigious TV documentaries in which we are treated to endless footage of creatures ranging from amoebas to giant carnivores, stalking, seizing, and with concentrated deliberation, soberly crunching, munching, swallowing, and ingesting other insects, fishes, birds, and mammals. This, we are told again and again, is the real process by which all things were created. Everything is lunching on everything else all the time, and that, children, is what makes us what we are. That is the key to progress. And note it well, all these creatures, when they are not lunching, are hunting for lunch. They all have to work for it. There is no free lunch in the world of nature, the real world. Lunch is the meaning of life, and everything lunches on something else. Nature red in tooth and claw. Tennyson's happy phrase suited the Victorian mind to perfection. He got the idea from Darwin, as Spencer did his even happier phrase, survival of the fittest. Darwin gave the blessing of science to men who had been hoping and praying for holy sanction to an otherwise immoral way of life. Malthus has shown that there will never be enough lunch for everybody, and therefore people would have to fight for it and Ricardo had shown by his iron law of wages that those left behind and gobbled up in the struggle for lunch had no just cause for complaint. Darwin showed that this was an inexorable law of nature by which the race was actually improved. Mial and Spencer made it the cornerstone of the gospel of free enterprise. The weaker must fall, by the way, if the stock is to be improved. This was movingly expressed in J.D. Rockefeller's discourse on the American Beauty Rose, which, he said, can be produced only by sacrificing the early buds which grow up around it. This is not an evil tendency in business, it is merely the working out of a law of nature and a law of God. In this divinely appointed game of grabs, to share the lunch prize would be futile, counterproductive, nay, immoral. Since there is not enough to go around, whoever gets his fill must be taking it from others. That is the way the game is played. In Liverpool, Manchester, Preston, or anywhere else in England, as Brigham Young reported the scene in 1856, workers knew that their employers would make them do their work for nothing, and then compel them to live on roots and grass if their physical organization could endure it. 
Therefore, says the mechanic, if I can get anything out of you, I will call it a godsend, and does what he can to rip off the boss. If he gets caught, he is punished, yet he is only playing the same game as his employer. Three years after Brigham made his observation, the origin of species appeared, putting the unimpeachable seal of science on the lunch grab as the supreme law of life and progress. And it was expressly to refute that philosophy on which Brigham Young founded Brigham Young University in 1875. We have enough and to spare at present in these mountains of schools where the teachers dare not mention the principles of the gospel to their pupils, but have no hesitancy in introducing into the classroom the theories of Huxley or Darwin or of Mial and the false political economy which contends against cooperation and the united order. This course I am resolutely and uncompromisingly opposed to. As a beginning in this direction, I have endowed the Brigham Young Academy at Provo and am now seeking to do the same thing in Salt Lake City. With his usual unfailing insight, President Young saw it was the economic and political rather than the scientific and biological implications of natural selection that were the real danger and most counter to the gospel. The Two Employers But what about those goodies that actually descend from the sky according to the new astronomy? They take us back to our Latter-day Saint creation story, in which all the earth's food supply is indeed brought from above, as seeds of all kinds are carried down and planted in a special program of preparing the earth for its great calling. Adam, we have created for you this earth, and have placed in it everything you could possibly need, all finished and ready for use. Help yourself. Of every tree thou mayest freely eat. Was Adam idle and bored, his character undermined by such easy living? Hardly. He went happily about his work of taking good care of the place. He enjoyed frequent conversation with angels, and in the cool of the evening he strolls with the Lord himself. What a vast expansion of mind and spirit that evokes! And to spend one's days with a woman of infinite understanding, whom age could not wither nor custom stale, was enough to fill the days with endless delight. When Adam left the garden, he went right on with his work of cultivating the earth, himself and his numerous posterity engaging in the three activities that are recommended as the proper way of life to all who work in the vineyard. Behold, I say unto you that you shall let your time be devoted to one, studying of the scriptures, and two, to preaching and to confirming the church, and three, to performing your labors on the land. Study, the work of the kingdom, and the cultivating of the soil were Adam's calling for almost a millennium, and he never got bored. Though no longer in paradise, he enjoyed the visitation and instruction of heavenly visitors, who undertook to teach him how he was to return again to his pre-existent splendor with enhanced qualifications and credentials for what lay ahead. To merit such a promotion, he was to be tried and tested while he was here, and for that express purpose Adam had to come to an understanding with another type of visitor, a person of enormous ambition and cunning, who was purposely turned loose in the place to put Adam and Eve to the test. What he tempts them with is lunch. We can put the situation in terms of two employers who are competing for the services of the man Adam and his posterity, who are intentionally placed in the middle between them. On the one hand, the devil inviteth and enticeth continually to work for him, while on the other, God inviteth and enticeth continually to work for him. The first employer offers us lunch, and since lunch is something everybody must have, he is in a powerful position to bargain. He explains that this glorious earth is his private estate, that it all belongs to him to the ends thereof. In particular, he owns the mineral rights and the media of exchange, by controlling which he enjoys the willing cooperation of the military, ecclesiastical, and political establishments, and rules with magnificent uproar. He keeps everything under tight control, though, for all the blood and horror. Nobody makes any trouble in his world from the rivers to the ends thereof. Well, can he ask Adam, What is it you want? For he claims to be the God of this world, and the Lord himself grants him the title of Prince of this world. All who are not working for him on his estate he charges with trespassing, including even heavenly messengers whom he accuses of spying out his vast property with an eye to taking over the whole of it. But he is willing to make a deal if they have money. To have merely sufficient for your needs, however, is not what he has in mind. That would be the equivalent of the free lunch lamely ignoring the endless possibilities for acquiring power and gain that the place offers. This developer has a vision of unlimited sweep and power. 
You can have anything in this world for money, beginning, of course, with lunch, because money is the only thing that will get you lunch, and since everybody must have lunch, that is the secret of his control. This almost mystical identity of money with lunch we see in the reports of Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, and others of their missions in England, where people were literally starving to death in the streets, while many in the city were living in the greatest opulence. The only trouble was that the poor people had to starve because they could get no money, and they could get no money because the factories were closed, and the factories were closed because of an unusually severe winter, an act of God. So there was plainly nothing to be done and no one to blame. One does not oppose the laws of nature and of God. There is no free lunch. Brother Kimball tells how his family in this fair land lived for weeks on boiled milkweed. They had worked very hard, but still there was no lunch for them because the money they had saved up by their diligent toil was suddenly worthless. It is money alone that gets you lunch. Mere work is not enough. Your prospective employer explains how this is. The money part is necessary to keep things under control. For the Kimballs, lunch was life itself, the bottom line of any economy. What would happen then if lunch was always provided free for them? Would they not lose their most immediate incentive to work, the need for lunch money? And since money, as they tell you in Economics 101, is the power to command goods and services, who would ever do any work again? How can you command somebody to work for you if he doesn't need your lunch? That, the shrewd employer explains, is why he must never cease reminding one and all in his domain that there is no free lunch. It is that great teaching which keeps his establishment going. All I have to do to bring my people into line, he says, is to ask them, if you leave my employ, what will become of you? That scares the daylights out of them, from the man on the dreary assembly line to the chairman of the board. They are all scared stiff. And so, I get things done. So let us go across the road for an interview with the other employer. To our surprise, he answers our first question with an emphatic, Forget about lunch. Don't even give it a thought. Take no thought of what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, or wherewith ye shall be clothed. But what will become of me then, you ask? Not to worry. We will preach the gospel to you, and then you will find out that lunch should be the least of your concerns. Let Brigham Young explain the situation. We have been permitted to come here to go to school, to acquire certain knowledge and take a number of tests to prepare us for greater things hereafter. This whole life, in fact, is a state of probation. While we are at school, our generous patron has provided us with all the necessities of living that we will need to carry us through. Imagine, then, that at the end of the first school year your kind benefactor pays the school a visit. He meets you and asks you how you are doing. Oh, you say, I am doing very well, thanks to your bounty. Are you studying a lot? Yes, I am making good progress. What subjects are you studying? Oh, I am studying courses in how to get more lunch. You study that all the time? Yes, I thought of studying some other subjects. Indeed, I would love to study them. Some of them are so fascinating. But after all, it's the bread and butter courses that count. This is the real world, you know. There is no free lunch. But my dear boy, I'm providing you with that right now. Yes, for the time being, and I am grateful. But my purpose in life is to get more and better lunches. I want to go right to the top, the executive suite, the Marriott lunch. But that is not the work that I wanted you to do here, says the patron. The question in our minds ought to be, says Brigham Young, what will advance the general interests and increase intelligence in the minds of the people? To do this should be our constant study in preference to how we shall secure that farm or that garden, that is, where the lunch comes from, We cannot worship our God in public meetings or kneel down to pray in our families without the images of earthly possessions rising up in our minds to distract them and make our worship and our prayers unprofitable. Lunch can easily become the one thing that the whole office looks forward to all morning, a distraction, a decoy. Like sex, it is a passing need that can only too easily become an engrossing obsession. Brigham says, It is a folly for man to love any other kind of property and possessions. One that places his affections upon such things does not understand that they are made for the comfort of the creature and not for his adoration. They are made to sustain and preserve the body while procuring the knowledge and wisdom that pertain to God and his kingdom, the school motif, in order that we may preserve ourselves and live forever in his presence. And about work? 
I once had a university fellowship for which I had to agree not to accept any gainful employment for the period of a year. All living necessities were supplied. I was actually forbidden to work for lunch. Was it free lunch? I never worked so hard in my life, but I never gave lunch a thought. I wasn't supposed to. I was eating only so that I could do my work. I was not working only so that I could eat. And that is what the Lord asks us, to forget about lunch and do His work, and the lunch will be taken care of. Not being an economist, I must here turn to the Scriptures, where I find a succinct but detailed and lucid statement of the lunch situation, that is, of God's economic precepts for Israel in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses distributes the lunch. After Moses had led the children of Israel for forty years, he summed up all the rules and regulations by which they were to live in a great farewell address, which was to be preserved in writing on stone and parchment and periodically and publicly read to all the people. All prosperity and life itself in the new promised land would depend on the strict observance of the law. Certain general principles were to govern every aspect of life among the children of the covenant. 1. This is the law by which you are to live, and the only law. It is your life, and through this ye shall prolong your days in the land. 2. However impractical and unrealistic these rules and precepts may seem to the world, you are not of the world, but wholly withdrawn from it, a people chosen, set apart, removed, peculiar, sanctified, above all people that are on the face of the earth, and holy people. Israel is under a special covenant with God that has nothing to do with the normal economy of men. They are forbidden to do some things and required to do others that may seem perfectly absurd to outsiders. 3. The legal aspects of the things are not what counts. The business of lawyers is to get around the law, but you must have it written in your hearts to keep it with all thine heart and with all thy soul, because you really love the Lord and his law, which begins and ends with the love of God and each other. It must be a natural thing to you, taken for granted, your way of life as you think and talk about it all the time, so that your children grow up breathing it as naturally as air. 4. Remember that everything you have is a free gift from God. You had nothing, and He gave you everything. 5. Never get the idea that you have earned what you have. Beware lest when thou hast eaten and art full, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, and you say to yourself, My power and might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But you must bear in mind that God alone has given it all to you, and it is not for any merit of yours, but for the sake of confirming promises made to your fathers that he has done it. If you forget that for a moment, you will be destroyed. And while our flocks and herds were increasing upon the mountains and the plains, said Brigham, the eyes of the people seemed closed to the operations of the invisible hand of providence, and they were prone to say, It is our own handiwork, it is our labor that has performed this. Work We Must But the Lunch is Free is continued on disc number four.